There are three things which are stately in their march. That word stately means confident, it means bold, it means dignity. This is what this is saying. There's three things that are stately in their march. That means confident, dignity. They, that, that means they know who they are. This is what it says. And the first one on the list, we're only going to cover the first one. The lion, see the Bible says the lion is stately in his march. The lion knows who he is. The lion is confident. The lion has dignity. You ever watch any videos of any lions that are walking and they just, they walk slow, they know who they are, they're not concerned about anybody around them, they're not concerned about their surroundings, they're certainly not concerned about you, we are more concerned about them. If you're in the wild and you see a lion, guess who runs? <laughs> not him, okay? <laughs> Boom, we're gone. So, uh, and this is what it says, this is pretty cool. Look at this, for the lion is stately in their walk, they're confident, now look at this, the lion which is mighty among beasts. This is this t-shirt right here. I usually don't wear just a t-shirt, but today we're talking about the lion, hence the t-shirt. So this is the deal, look at what this says. For the lion is mighty among beasts. That's, you know, the world says he's king of the jungle. That's not really so, because they don't really live in the jungle, they live in the plains. But the Bible says that the lion's king, man. He knows who he is, and he's mighty among the beasts. Then it says this, this is so cool. He does not retreat, he does not turn back. He does not turn away from any. The lion knows who he is. He's mighty among beasts and he does not retreat before any. Proverbs 28 1 says the righteous, listen if we are in Christ we are the righteous, the righteous are to be bold as a lion. So I look at these two verses and I'm thinking okay uh, you're telling me to be bold as a lion. You're telling me who one who knows Christ Jesus, who knows that I'm righteous only because of Jesus, only because of the work of the cross, only because of what he's done for me, then the righteous, those who were right before God, are to be bold, confident as a lion. So I look at this and I say, okay, the lion knows who he is. And he doesn't turn away from, he never retreats. He doesn't turn back from any. Father, I thank you for this time. God, I'm asking that you bless this message. Father, I thank you for our time of worship. You are so amazing and you are so good. And God, as we just get into this, Lord, every week we come into this place, God. Week after week we come into this place to hear your truth. God, this amazing book that I hold in my hand is life. God, it gives us truths week after week after week. We have truth here, God. We thank you for your word. Speak to us this morning. Open our hearts to hear what we need to hear this morning, God. Open our eyes to see exactly what we need to see. Father, I'm asking for everyone's attention to put it on you. Put it in your word. See where this applies in our lives. God, it's so good. I thank you for this word. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would have my tongue, that we would speak this and preach this in a way that would bless and encourage the people here this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. See, gang, we see this. And every week we come in and we open this book. And every week we want to walk out different. We want to walk out changed, knowing that we didn't just come to church to check a box. Well, it's Sunday. This is what we do. It's Sunday. I'm telling you what, uh, Sunday's my best day. I, love, I can't wait. Like, Sunday at about 1 o'clock when we're done, I'm looking forward to next Sunday. I, I just love to get together with the family. I love bringing people in to have that opportunity to worship God, to have that, that opportunity to engage with God. That's amazing. The creator of the universe, we get to engage with him. Incredible. And now we get to open this amazing book that is full of life, that can instruct us, that can change us, that can get us right on path and understand where we're going. Amazing stuff. Every Sunday, this is what we love. And man, I tell you what, I don't want you just to come to church to check a box, but to come to church, to engage with God, and then to just open up the amazing word of God and get fed and come hungry for his word. I love this. And then I see this, I'm saying, okay, God, this is amazing that you're telling us that the lion is mighty among beasts and he does not ever turn away. But today, this morning, we're gonna talk about what it is when him being so confident. And we're to have that confidence. When, when the Bible says the righteous should be bold as a lion, it, that word means confidence. So um, there's things that we need to know. I think number one in this message is this. That if you're confident, you will know who you are. 
And gang, I tell you what, when we understand as believers, when we understand, yes, we know Jesus, we understand, yes, it's all about him, then there is, there, there is this amazing sense that if I am going to walk in a confidence because I belong to him, then I need to know who I am. And, and I really believe, I'm telling you what, when I get done with speaking on the Eagles, I think I'm praying through this. I'm already like a couple weeks, a month ahead, and I think I'm going to do a whole series on who we are in Christ. Because that is foundation. Gang, when you recognize who you are, you are redeemed. You are reconciled. You are set free. The chains are gone. When you get, you are adopted. You are eternally going to heaven with him. You are saved. You are set free from anything of wrath or condemnation from God himself. When we begin to recognize who we are in him, there will be a confidence in you. Because, no, nope, that's not who I am. No, nope. I know who I am, and that's not it. I know who I am, that's not me. And we're going to, I'm praying through this. I, in worship, I still was writing stuff down for it. I'm excited for that. But you know what? That's, wow, that's so far ahead. Let's look at this. Come on. You know who you are, right? I want, I want to show you a couple of verses here. Job 33, 4. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We know that. Day 6, God created man. Now look at this. This is amazing. The Spirit of God has made me. Gang, you've got to recognize if I'm going to, to be bold as a lion, I'm going to be confident and know who I am. He is stately in his walk. The lion knows exactly who he is. Gang, we as Christians, we as believers, we didn't know exactly who we are. Now look at this. This is Job. Job 33, 4. The Spirit of God has made me. Now look at this. This is huge. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. Who is it that gave you life? The Almighty. The one true living God who has always been, who will always be, who cannot change, is the one who said, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this amazing thing on day six. The Bible says in Genesis 2-7 that God had this whole bunch of this dust, and he, and he formed a man out of this dust. And then the Bible says in Genesis 2-7 that he breathed into his nostrils, and then there was life. And that dust became a living being. That's mind-blowing. That's like, what? Wow, from this pile of dirt, this pile of dust, where God breathed into their nostrils, and all of a sudden, <sighs> breath of the Almighty, there was life. And that life became a living being. You know what? That's mankind. And that's God's work in us. And we begin to recognize, number one, in this, in, in that I need to know who I am. And that means I have been created by Almighty God. And he says, listen, I have taken dust and made man, I've breathed life. And then Job 33, 4, the Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So you gotta recognize right off the bat, you have life because Almighty God chose to give you life. That's incredible, that's incredible. Ephesians 2 says this, look at this. You, we are his workmanship. You know what that word workmanship? It means that you have been handcrafted by God. You ever see a pottery and, and they're creating and doing all kinds of cool stuff and they're just making this spinning wheel and they're making this piece of pottery that's just gorgeous and beautiful. And this is that same type of word. We are his craftsmanship. God is the ultimate one who can make amazing things. He's created the heavens and the earth. He's put the sun, the moon, and the stars in place and how brilliant they are. And then he says, you know what? I'm going to handcraft mankind. And we begin to recognize that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. When we begin to recognize that we need to be confident in who we are, because number one, God gave me life. I would have no life if God didn't breathe life to me. Number two, that he created me for a purpose. Look at this. We are his workmanship. We are his handcraftedness created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Gang, we have been created with a purpose. When we begin to understand God breathed life into me, he's created me for a purpose, we begin to really gain some confidence. Now look at this. Come on. 2 Corinthians 5. This is huge. I want you to see this. 2 Corinthians 5. It says this, verse, I want to start at verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone, again, this is 
who we are in Christ. If you are going to be stately in your walk as a believer, you need to know who you are. This is a spit in the ocean compared to what we're going to touch on uh, in the future. But look at this, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed, and all things have become new. And we're singing this new song this morning called Redeem. That's just a powerful song. I can't wait until we really get into that song and really know that song as we're worshiping and as we're crying out to God. Because we're, we're in the midst of this song, and this verse, and, I, and I've been studying this verse for the week, and I'm thinking, old things are gone, new things have come. I'm a new creature. I'm a new creation in Christ. Only in Christ. Because of Christ. All old things have passed. New things have come. And then we're singing this song this morning. And these words just were just popping in my heart. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I used to be. We're, we're singing this song named Redeem. And this, I am not who I used to be. I am not who I used to be. I, and this just kept playing over my heart. I am not who I used to be. All things, all things, all things have passed away. Behold, all new things have come. Gang, when we get the real picture of who we are in Christ, we look at this and say, I am not the same. I am not the same. I am not who I used to be. Jesus has come into my life. He reigns and dwells in me. My attention and my focus is now on him. All things have changed. I am not who I used to be. Gang, every one of us who know Christ, I'm not talking about, uh, there are amazing testimonies of the, you know, the teenage werewolf, the, 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 the drug addict, the, the, the drunkard, the one who is, that whole, that's an amazing story of when saying, listen, I am not who I used to be. That who is who I was. Jesus came in, all things became new, and I'm an overcomer. That's an amazing testimony. But I'm talking about every single one of us who have Christ in our lives are not the same. We don't think the same. We don't act the same. We don't talk the same. All things. All things. Listen, our past afflictions, our past sins, who we used to be, has changed. We don't know that unless we dig into Scripture and, and get into this verse and say, I am not who I used to be. Why? Because Jesus. Because Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now look at this, verse 18. All these things are from God, who reconciled us. This word reconciled, huge, huge word in faith. It means from enemy to friend. Do you understand that because all have sinned, all are separate from God, all have sinned, all, every single person who has ever had breath has sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, every single person. And we can begin to recognize because of sin, we were separate from God and became an enemy to God. The Bible says this, because of that, he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross for you and I. And in doing so, when we come to this place of faith and recognize who he is, it's amazing this word reconciled, it means once I was an enemy and now I'm a friend. Once I was against God, sinning, separate from God, rejecting God, and now I understand this amazing relationship that I can have with him because I have been reconciled. He has taken me from being an enemy to now being a friend. And that, that speaks volumes about relationship. Who we are in Christ is based on a relationship, not a system. Who we are in Christ is based on a relationship, not a religion. Who we are in Christ is based on a relationship, not because you come to Believer's Chapel, not because you've gone to another church, not because you belong to a different system. We are in relationship with God because of Jesus Christ, as not because of a church, not because of a system, not because of religion, because of a relationship. We sung it this morning, oh, how he loves us. When we recognize how much he loves us, the relationship is reciprocal. He says, the one thing, the one thing I want from you most is that you would love me back. Gang, that is not system, that is not religion, that's relationship. And this is what this, this word screams this. This is what it says, listen, who reconciled, who took you from an enemy to a friend. Gang, we gotta get this, this is so huge. Because you've got to know who you are. To walk in great confidence, you've gotta get this. You gotta know I was once an enemy, and now I'm a friend, and now I'm walking in this relationship. Look at this. Who reconciled us to himself, through Christ, gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. 
Listen, God sent Christ to do the very thing of reconciling the world. That is the lost. God so loved the world that he gave. This is the same word. He's talking about the world was lost. Jesus came for the whole purpose of bridging that gap, of bringing people back to a reconciled, fixed relationship with him. Amazing. Now look at this. This is great. Verse 17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things are new. Now look at this. Verse 19. That God was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself. Look at this. Highlight this. Underline this. This is huge. Not counting their trespasses against them. Gang, this is what's so huge. Is when we are in marriage, when we're in different relationships, there are struggles that come in. There are times that, that I love it when I hear marriages that are on the brink, about ready to end it. And then, then they come and understand Jesus. They come to, to, to repent and they come to say, I'm sorry. And there is forgiveness granted and it's amazing. And then this marriage, this relationship, one of, the, one of the main things we seek in this church when there is marriage difficulties, divorces on the horizon, the one thing that we pay out to God, God, that this marriage would be reconciled. Have you ever heard that? Marriage, let this marriage be reckoned. That means going from that point of enemy, almost separation, to back to that amazing place of, of restoration, amazing place of reconciliation, amazing place of back in that amazing relationship that we once had. And to do that, not counting the trespasses against them. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, love keeps no record of wrong. Gang, this is what blows me away about our amazing God is that he is not up there with a pen. Sean, I'm recording everything. Every one of your sins, I've got it down in, and you're going to answer for those sins. Folks, that is religion. That is not happening. Jesus came and took, we heard it last week, powerful message. He took all of our sin, gone, past, present, and future. For the believer, we will not stand and account for our sin because that is why we need Jesus. That is why Jesus came, is to do that very thing. Cannot be done twice. God is not up there with a marker. Well, back in 1988, back in 1987, back in 1989, Sean, back in, I saw you when... Look at this, is huge. When we have gone from enemy to friend, we gotta understand this, not counting their trespasses against them. Gang, that should speak volumes to every one of us because every one of us have a past and every one of us have trespasses that very easily a holy God could count against us. But because he loves us with such a love that we just can't understand, he will not count the trespasses against us. Amazing, now look at this, verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. When we understand this is a huge piece to who we are. You are an ambassador for Christ. You know what ambassador means? It means one who is a messenger or a representative. Listen, we are messengers. It's amazing to me that he's left it up to us, his children, to represent Jesus to represent heaven. When you get into Philippians 3.20, we just talked on it a few weeks ago, livingouttruth.com, you can see all this stuff and hear all this stuff online. We talked about what it was in heaven. We talked about that we are, we are not citizens here. This is not our home. And we get to recognize that heaven is our home. And Jesus can come at any moment and take us home. But while we're here in this foreign land as Christians, as believers, the Bible says you are an ambassador. Your home is there, but you represent Jesus here, as a messenger and a representative of him. I see this and I'm thinking, that's, wow, that's a huge responsibility. Now, where, there must be some serious training in this. Where is all the classes I'm supposed to take to understand how it is to represent Jesus, how it is to be a messenger for him? I mean, I think, where is all the class? Why, how come Jesus didn't come down and give us a big class on what it is to be an ambassador for him? Bible 101, folks, right here's the class. And we see this, and I'm thinking, okay, God, that needs, how can we, we can't be this, this wimpy, little confused ambassador. We can't be. I mean, it would be horrible if we had an ambassador for the United States of America, and he was confused, and he was a little sissy, and he didn't know what to think, and he didn't know what to do, and he didn't know anything about America. How does he represent America in that state? 
Folks, we are ambassadors for the king. We are his spokesmen. We are his representatives. Here, now that we have Christ in our lives, it is that we've got to get this. It's huge. That now we understand that I represent him. And we need to be very confident that we represent our king well. Therefore, we are ambassadors. We are representatives for Christ. As, look at this, as though God, look at this, this is so big. As though God were making an appeal through us. As though God were making an appeal. As if it were God doing the work. But he has chose to use you and I to make the appeal. Now look at this, this is huge. Look at this. This is what we're writing this, Paul's writing this, and this is what he says. As though God were making an appeal through us. Look what he says. We beg you. We beg you. Why? Because he's saying, listen, just as if God were here himself, he would beg you. This is how Paul preached. This is how Paul got before people. Look at this. He says, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Listen, this is, this is where Paul says, listen, we are ambassadors. We represent the king. We represent what he's done. We represent God. God has chosen to use us. As if God were saying this, Paul says, please, Please understand Christ. Please understand your sin. Please understand that you need to be reconciled. And, and Paul is saying we, would, we beg people just as God would. Okay, when is the last time you really begged somebody because you understood their state before Christ? Well, you understood that they were lost, bound for hell for an eternity without Jesus. And then we come over and say, would you please understand? This is amazing. Without Christ in your life, you are still in the enemy state. But God wants you to become a friend. God wants to be in relationship with you based on what Jesus has done. When is the last time we begged people? As a representative of the king, one who represents Jesus, his messenger, Folks, we've got to have confidence in this. If we are going to win this region and we're going to preach this truth week after week after week, begging God to bring people in, begging God for this area, begging God for salvation, that people recognize that it is relationship, it's Jesus, it's Jesus alone. We have to be confident in this. We have to know who we are in this. And the Bible says if you have Christ in your life, you are an ambassador. You represent the king. We're to do it in such a way that we have such confidence that we have the ability to beg people through Christ that they be reconciled to God. How do you do that? When you understand that relationship yourself. When you understand this is not a religion. This is not a do's and don'ts. This is not a big long list of what you can do, what you can't do. This is a relationship that I love Jesus so much because of what he's done for me. That it's no longer about me. And it's about him. I no longer represent myself. I represent him. I'm his ambassador. And knowing this reconciliation, knowing that I have gone from enemy to friend, this, this is the state, man. This is, we are to beg people. So you, you need to go to that relationship because we understand the relationship. Because we understand the relationship that we have with him, there should be a confidence based on that. Huge, huge. Number two is this. Number one, if you're going to be confident and bold as a lion, and you're going to be stately in your way. Listen, there's a difference between confidence and cocky, folks. There's a difference between being confident and being cocky. Cocky is arrogance and pride in which God hates. Being confident is we don't represent ourselves. I can be confident because I don't represent me. I'm an ambassador for the king. When I'm always talking about him, I always talk about his work, I always talk about the lives of people, and it's always about him and not about me, there's a difference. There's a thin line there. We need to walk in confidence. Number two is this, is you need to know what you believe. If you're going to be confident, if you're going to be bold, you need to come to the understanding of what you really believe. I want you to show this. Acts 4. Please turn over to Acts 4. Verse 13 says this. I love this. You've got, you've got Acts 2. Jesus gave the last words. I mean, Acts 1. Jesus gave the last words. 
to, to, the, to the apostles, I am coming back, I will return, right? And then you got Acts 2, they, they get filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Spirit of God to go out and preach and minister. Uh, you see Acts 3, this is very near after Jesus just ascended, okay? He just left. They are just fired up, man. You've got Peter, he's preaching. 3,000 people get saved. You got Peter, he's preaching. 5,000 people get saved. I mean, you want to talk about one who went from denying Christ, even the knowing Christ, to being bold enough to preach right after. Gang, this is right after the crucifixion. They saw how Jesus got beat. They saw how Jesus got flogged and whipped. They saw his body be torn apart. And that, that scared them. God, I don't know him. <laughs> that could happen to me. And then Jesus comes out of the grave. They get absolute foundation in who Christ really was. Spirit of God comes in their life. And they are never the same again. This, is, this isn't like, oh, this was years and years later that Peter got bold. No, it was, this, is, this is, look at this, this is huge. Acts 4.13 says this. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated, untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. They were amazed. Look at this. They saw this confidence in Peter and John. Now look at it. What is it that they saw? Listen, there's an amazing story that is attached to this. You've got Peter and John. They're going into the temple to speak. And there's this lame man. He's been lame from birth. He's never walked, never been able to stand on his feet in any, in any day of his life. He's never had strength in his feet. Never been able to walk, never been able to stand, never been able to jump, never to be like everybody else. And every day someone would have to carry this man. Now he's a man, he's an adult. Carry this man, sit him in front of the temple, and he would beg for money. So here you've got Peter and John, they come in, they're going in the temple, and this is all in Acts 3, and this guy, you know, puts out his hand or whatever, and they say, you know what, we, we got no green for you, brother, we got no money, uh, just don't have that, but what we do have, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. The Bible says they reached him by the hand, stood up, strength immediately came to his legs, and this guy, who's never walked before, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, he begins to jump up and down. The Bible says he just begins, wouldn't you? Celebrate, jump up and down, leap, make a huge commotion on the street, make a huge commotion in front of the temple. Got a lot of attention. The Bible says that everyone started taking note. Isn't that that lame guy? Isn't that that one that all he does is beg? Isn't that that one that's never walked before? Wouldn't it be horrible to be pegged to that? And now we see him leaping. Now we see him jumping. Now we see him celebrating. Now he's praising God. Now I want, you, I, want you, I want to read this to you. If you're right there, Acts 3, look at this. Verse 8. With a leap, he stood upright, began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praying. I mean, he's just celebrating, right? Now, all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him, being one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple and beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened. And while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together, and them were so called to the, the porch of Solomon, full of amazement. Now, this is the kicker, verse 12. This is huge. Now, when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our power? Here, they're looking at Peter and John thinking, these guys are, you guys are so powerful. You guys are miracle workers. You guys, are, and they started to cling to them. They started to come to Peter and John. Peter's like, wait a minute. This is not about us. We didn't have the power to do this. This is huge. You want to talk about bold? You want to talk about confidence? You want to talk about kicking someone where it hurts? Look at what Peter says. Peter is good at that. Look at this. Check this out. This is what he's saying to all these people. The God of Abraham, verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. It's always about Jesus. Look at this. He has glorified his servant. Look what he says. Gang, prepare for this. Because he's booting. Now look at this. The one whom you delivered, the one whom you disowned, in the presence of Pilate, who decided to release him, but you disown. That word for disown, it means to reject, to deny. He's, we are here only in the glorified one called Jesus Christ. Remember remember the one on the cross just, just a little bit ago? The one that you rejected? The one that you disowned? Look at what he says. It's huge. 
You disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murder to be granted to you. Remember you did that? And put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. Where does the confidence come from, folks? To the fact that we are witnesses. We know that Jesus is exactly who he said he is because we saw, we saw him in the physical. We touched him in the physical. We know that God raised him from the dead. He did exactly what he said he was gonna do. And you, you think this is on us? You think that we have the ability to heal? It was in Jesus, the one you turned away from. It was in Jesus, the one that you murdered. It was in Jesus, the one that you disowned. You talk about confidence, you talk about guts, well, verse, chapter 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them. Now look at this. Being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and they put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. Get verse 4. This is huge. Look at Paul's whole thing, his whole, his whole, his whole being so bold and so confident and proclaiming Christ. Look what happened. But many of those who had heard the message believed and the number of men came about 5,000. In his rant, in his rage about them who turned away Jesus, them who disowned Jesus, the Bible says that there were 5,000 men, not including women and children, 5,000 men who turned their life to Christ. You want to talk about the result of being bold? You want to talk about the result of being confident? Now this is huge. And we think he's just talking to, to, to the Israelites. He's just talking to these people. Look what he says to the Sadducees, to the high priests, the captain of the temple guard. This is awesome. This is awesome. He'd been in jail for a night. Verse 5, on the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were together, gathered together in Jerusalem. And look at this. Annas, the high priest, was there. Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and all who are of the high priestly descent. Gang, this is the who's who. Of leadership. This is the who's who. These are the top dogs of the high priest. These are the top dogs. And this is this is it right here. Look at look at what he says. This is awesome. But Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says to the rulers and the elders of the people. He is speaking to the highest of the high. He's speaking to the who's who of the priestly descent. If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, how is it that this man has been made well? Let it be known, look at this, let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you today in good health. Now look at this, talking about Jesus. Jesus is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders by which, look at, he became the chief cornerstone and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which men must be saved gang he is speaking to Annas he is speaking to Kephi guess who guess who's the one who put Christ on the cross all right look at this we see this uh, you've got Caiaphas who was the one who had the secret meeting that came up with the big plan to arrest Jesus and put him on trial here you've got Peter who was once uh, nervous, who was once denied Christ, who once saw this whole thing unfold, now speaking to the very ones who put Jesus on the cross, the very ones who put him on trial, the very ones who shoved him before Pilate, saying he's a false witness. Jesus is the one who did this. Jesus is causing a riot. You want to talk about confidence? You want to talk about boldness? He's in jail. And he's talking to the highest of the high who just just in the recent past, they're the ones who came up with the plan to put Jesus to death. And here he is in their face saying, you, you are the ones. You're the ones who rejected Christ. I don't stand here in my own name. We had no part in this. It was by Jesus. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, make no mistake. It is the one from Nazareth. There's only one, and that's the one. And he's the one you put on a cross. He's the one. He mentions it. He's the one who was raised from the dead. You want to talk about a confidence in Peter? Verse 13. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John. See, when you see the background to this, they are seeing something in Peter that they're not accustomed to, folks. And understood that they were uneducated, untrained men. 
They were amazed. <laughs> they began to recognize them as ones who have been with Jesus. 